some freedom for all or all freedom for some. So a big thing happened in the US recently. The Supreme Court overturned a judgment which prevented corporations from directly using their treasuries to run political advertising and to campaign on behalf of political candidates. Before, of course, this was possible through political action committees, the PACs, and through funneling money as donations in various ways. And I guess you could make the argument that, yes, actually, in a way, nothing has really changed. It's just become easier for corporate money to be active in the political process. So, really, it is a consistent kind of statement. If you're looking at before, we're saying, okay, corporate money can go into the electoral process, but we're going to make it harder. Now they just said, well, if, if you can do it, then you should be able to just do it. Why are we making it harder? Either it's allowed or not allowed. But there's a deeper question of whether this money should be in the process at all through PACs or through anything. So a lot of people on the left are worried by this, by this decision. At the same time, there are many on the left that agree with this decision and say that corporations should enjoy freedom of speech. So this is kind of like the kind of classic liberal tilt of as much freedom as possible, right? They're made up of people, they should be free to say whatever they like. Um, and freedom at all costs, never forbid anything. And so owners of corporations are people and they should be able to use their resources to speak, right? Okay, let's disregard for a moment that CEOs that make these decisions on who to support and how to do it don't do this democratically. They don't hold a poll of all the shareholders, the actual owners, to see what they think. No, no. They make decisions and they don't own a majority of the corporation. But let's leave that aside for now and assume that in some democratic way, the owners of corporations, based on their stake, decide how to use this corporate money. So then is this is this okay? Is this speech free? Are we really doing something wrong by not allowing this to happen? Well, how free really is your speech? We can talk to people, we can blog online, we can YouTube, we can put up videos, but we can't purchase TV advertising, we can't purchase roadside advertising, we can't purchase radio advertising, we can't purchase viral advertising, we can't have the power and clout to get our opinions heard on talk shows. Okay, theoretically, actually, we could. We're free to do that. All we need is millions of dollars lying around for when we want to open our mouths and be heard. So some people have that kind of money. Most people don't. Okay, but, you say, we can just join together, pool our money together into a non-profit corporation. There are various kinds. There are some in Australia and there are some in the U.S. Advocacy groups, non-profits. And then through that we can speak our mind and because we collect this money everyone gives a small amount and we can have our voice, right? Okay, theoretically yes, we can scrape together enough money to run an occasional ad on an issue that we really care very strongly about. But we're not really in the same par ballpark as corporations. Corporations have incredible wealth and we need to scrape for a couple of issues to get a little bit of press time. Okay, so why are we not in the same ballpark? Well, you have to take into account that 5% of the US population owns 60% of total US wealth. So if we're going to say we're going to base free speech on your ability to pay to be heard, then those 5% of people have 60% of the voice of America. Okay, then we take the bottom 80% who in total own 15% of the US so what that means is that each of these has one-fifth the voice that he or she should have were this free speech voice shared out uh, equally rather than based on some economic concern or supposed merit. What it means when you add it all up is that a very rich person has a voice that's 12 times louder than a very poor person. Then if you go to the super rich and you compare that, then of course their voice is comparatively far, far louder. And also, we have to take into consideration, of course, if you're a poor person, then you're going to be far less able to actually put some of that aside to put into your free speech concerns than a rich person. You have less disposable income, you also have far less disposable property. You need to save up because if you get sick and you don't have money, you might die. So both in terms of income and property, poor people don't have disposable income or property. So basically their voices are very, very quiet. 
also income distribution is getting worse. It's getting worse in the industrialized world. Uh, just n recently they released a report in the UK that showed that it got significantly worse since the 70s. It's gotten worse in the US. It's gotten worse in most of the European countries. Uh, there's a there's an indicator for this. It's called the, the Gini index. So that shows relative wealth inequalities and it's done on a kind of I guess yearly basis for different countries and there's a global trend of wealth being less and less equally distributed. Plus you have to add that we the poorer 80 percent in industrialized nations are still the luckiest ones here. We still have some level of wealth and disposable income to get hurt. There are people out there that don't have proper access to the internet. Basically, the voice of your average African is the sound of perfect silence. They do not have a voice. They do not have a free speech voice. They might have the right to free speech, but they don't have the ability to free speech. So this positive right really gives them nothing. I think it's a very unfair and unsincere thing to say that if you're someone who can't actually make use of this right, then it's still really a right. Maybe that's fine. Maybe that's just the way it is in economies. Maybe it's okay for rich people to have a louder voice. Is that is that the case? Well, let's just look at the days when democracy was its in its infancy and there was still a lot of elitism and monarchies that were struggling to maintain their power. What happened is we started having votes, but there was exclusion of min minorities and there was proportional voting. So exclusion of minorities were excluding whole groups of the population that somehow don't fit into our system from making their political vote count at all. They don't have a vote. And we have proportional voting. So if you're an important rich person or a noble person, you get a bigger vote. So your vote counts for 10 votes of a very poor person, say. That's just an example, but that's how it worked. Today, we are institutionalizing a system that undemocratizes free speech. So basically, we're stifling the speech of a vast majority of citizens by this process of proportionally accepting a lesser and lesser share in free speech. So we're allowing ourselves to be propagandized to and silenced. And the kicker here is we've been taught and we've learned very well to call this freedom. We call it freedom to have this supposed potential that we can't use. What I think is we need the greatest amount of freedom for the greatest possible number of people. If we're going to be satisfied with only the first part of that statement, we're betraying ourselves and we're betraying our fellow citizens because there will never be space for all of us in the top 5%. I mean, that's just math, folks.